Good afternoon. I know there's still a few people arriving, but I think it is time to start. I'm Rebecca Blank. I'm the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's Josh Rosenthal Education Fund Lecture. Today is the fifth anniversary of the horrific events of September 11, 2001. Today's gathering is a memorial to that event. It's a living memorial, one that focuses on the opportunity to think about the impact of 9-11 on international policy. In earlier eras, the foreign policy of nations focused on the balance of power or the containment of particular powers. After September 11, 2001, it became very clear that international policymakers needed to look beyond the political interactions of nations. In today's world, it is equally important to pay close attention to the role of non-state actors and the permeability of nation-state boundaries. Our program today is in memory of Josh Rosenthal, a 1979 graduate of the University of Michigan who died in the World Trade Center attacks on September 11th. Josh, who worked, in the world trade, who worked in the world of international finance, was engaged by the broad questions of public policy. It's a tribute to Josh that we are here today to explore some of the toughest questions facing us. This lecture memorializes Josh by providing the opportunity for all of us to analyze and interpret recent events, to discuss and reevaluate our positions, and to seek new policy approaches to both national and international security issues. I want to recognize several members of the Rosenthal family who are present today, Josh's cousins, Ellen Krieger and Richard Krieger, Suzanne Waller, and Gary Sirota. As we begin, I want to ask Marilyn Rosenthal, Josh's mother, to say a few words. Marilyn. As you can imagine, today is a swirl of emotions. I feel, uh, to a certain extent, the original chaos of September 11, 2001. Uh, I uh, feel a certain amount of confusion left over from those days. I have feelings of thanks for all the people who've been so helpful to me and to my family and all of you who've supported the Josh Rosenthal Education Fund. And uh, I, I also have learned about the power of knowledge and the power of hope. Okay, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in, in just a minute. But uh, I want to thank my family who came a distance to be with me today. I love them very much. Even if you don't come, I love you very much. <laughs> and I, I want to thank Dean Blank and her staff, uh, Laura Lee and Jean Stepp. And I, I want to t uh, uh, thank um, a new partner in the Josh Rosenthal Educational Lecture, that is the Provost Office, and particularly Dilip Das, who has uh, helped us add a new feature to the lecture. Out in the hall during the reception, you will see some material uh, provided to us by a group called Our Voices Together. And they are a group of 9-11 families from all over the country that are dedicating themselves to making something good come out of the horror. And they're dedicated to building hope and not hate. And what they're encouraging is that students and all of us get involved in service projects particularly some that have an international flavor, uh, and uh, try and work in this direct way to make this uh, a better world. So I urge you to take a look at their literature, and I'm proud to be a member of this group trying to do something positive. Five years later, I have to admit that the chaos caused by the attack on 9-11 has not subsided. If anything, it seems to have spread. Shocking, five years later, to recognize that. 
I think there's continued obfuscation, continued confusion of the issues that arose out of 9-11. I think there's very strange uses of the word terrorism. And I've met many 9-11 families this, this last year. They and I think American families all over the country are filled with increasing frustration. There's a longing, a deeply felt longing for more clarity, for deeper insight, and creative imagination to address the complex issues of the Middle East. I believe in the power of knowledge. I believe in honest information. And I believe in the power of balanced analysis and the power of open discourse to arrive at thoughtful policies and strategies that not only address immediate problems, but consider long-term consequences as well. And of course, the university is the place where this kind of discourse can be found. Indeed, this is the obligation of the university. And I am eternally grateful to be part of an enterprise which values expertise and careful scholarship. I am so proud to have Joshua's name connected with uh, that university enterprise and the Josh Rosenthal Educational Fund. So gratified that this fund is part of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, honoring a president who symbolizes integrity and decency in American politics. A few days ago, I was in New York, and as this anniversary approached, the city seemed heavy with sadness. But here today, in this auditorium, we are remembering not just Josh, but all the victims of 9-11 in the most appropriate way possible by honoring the kind of expertise that may help us find our way out of the chaos that continues to haunt us. We're fortunate this afternoon to listen to an articulate, knowledgeable expert on the Middle East. I'm delighted and proud to know he can be found in the halls of our university. And I look forward to his lectures and to the questions and discussion afterwards. You'll have many opportunities, you have plenty of opportunity to ask questions after Professor Cole's lecture. And I just want you to know an audience can be judged <laughs> by the quality of its questions. So, Start getting your questions ready. One more observation. Today is not only the fifth anniversary of the attack on the United States on September 11th, 2001. It is also the 100th anniversary of the Gandhi movement for peaceful nonviolent change, which began on September 11th, 1906. Perhaps there is hope as remember as we remember both 9-11s. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Marilyn. At lunch today, the Rosenthal family um, presented to the Ford School a picture of Josh shaking hands with President Gerald Ford as part of the summer intern program that he was in. It's a wonderful picture, and we're going to hang it in our new building, um, which is just south of the law school. You're also all invited to visit that building at some point, um, and it will be a fitting long-term memorial of this relationship between the Rosenthal family and the Ford School. The events of 9-11 are indelibly set in the national psyche. The attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon became a starting point for a vigorous and ongoing national debate about security and about the conduct of what would become known as the War on Terror. As the aftermath of the attacks continues to reverberate at home and abroad, there has been an ongoing debate about the most appropriate and best theories frameworks and principles to guide our nation's and other nations' international behavior in a post-9-11 world. Our speaker today is in the midst of that debate. Professor Juan Cole is a distinguished member of the University of Michigan faculty. He has written extensively about modern Islamic movements in Egypt, 
the Persian Gulf, and South Asia. His books include Sacred Space and Holy War, Modernity and the Millennium, and Colonialism and Revolution in the Middle East. And should you want to talk about something different, I understand he's just completing a book on Napoleon's invasion of Egypt. <laughs> Professor Cole is widely quoted in the media and has published political writings in places as diverse as The Guardian, the San Jose Mercury News, Salon.com, the San Francisco Chronicle, and The Nation. The commentary, insight, and resources he offers on his weblog reach audiences all over the world. If you haven't looked at this, I encourage you to, and have had a significant impact on the public debate over the war in Iraq and U.S. Mideast policy. In our last three lectures in memory of Josh Rosenthal, we went outside the university and brought some wonderful people here to campus. But as we were talking about names this year, it became very clear that the best name to bring in this year was actually sitting right here. I am absolutely delighted to call Professor Juan Cole to the podium to speak on the topic, Are We Winning the Fight Against Al-Qaeda? Reflections Five Years Later. Juan. Are the mics hot now? Yeah? OK. Uh, could, could we, is it possible to bring down the lights a little bit on the slideshow so it can be seen more clearly? Yeah. Thank you. Well, it is uh, a matter of great honor to me. I'm very touched to be invited to give the Josh Rosenthal Education Fund lecture this year. Um, all of us in the United States were deeply affected and traumatized by the events of September 11th, five years ago. But of course, uh, no one more so than the families of the direct victims. I myself had two relatives in the Pentagon that day, and I can only imagine the horror of hearing of the death of a loved one, of an innocent. Uh, in what at the time seemed a bizarre uh, set of events, uh, unparalleled in some ways since the Pearl Harbor attacks, and yet very different in so far as those were the attacks of a state on a state. Uh, they were unexpected but not ununderstandable. What happened on September 11th was of a different order of magnitude, and it was the action of a non-state actor. September 11th focused the energies of the U.S. government, counterterrorism personnel, diplomatic personnel, the U.S. military, intensively on the Middle East and the Muslim world. And let us just step back and consider for a second what we're speaking of when we speak of the Muslim world. It's an inexact map. Uh, some may want to query with some of the details, but I would defend its overall usefulness for thinking about the subject. The Muslim world, as the geographical extent of the spread of the Muslim religion and its practice, uh, is represented uh, in green for areas that are predominantly Muslim, uh, in light green in Nigeria and Kazakhstan for situations where it's 50-50. Uh, and then the yellow shows something like 7% to 15% Muslim population. Uh, India is therefore, in some real sense, a Muslim power with 12% uh, uh, population uh, Muslim. And of course, given that India has over a billion people, 12% amounts to something. Uh, uh, Russia is a Muslim power uh, with 10 to 15% Muslim. Given that the Russians have uh, 
somewhat mysteriously decided for the past 10 years to stop having children, uh, it seems likely that uh, in the, over the next century, uh, the proportion of Muslims in Russia uh, will rise substantially since they, uh, they know they want big families. Um, France is a Muslim power. Uh, it's controversial the exact percentage of Muslims in France, but uh, five to seven percent is, uh, is what's usually thought, and it's going to increase substantially, especially with regard to the voting population uh, in the next 20 years. 14% uh, of the French uh, voting population may well be uh, Muslim. Uh, so the Muslim world stretches uh, from the uh, Atlantic all the way over to Indonesia and the Indian Ocean. Uh, and uh, in some senses, this, the, the stretch is, is unbroken. Uh, although uh, there's a majority India population, uh, it is laced with, uh, with Muslim populations. That Muslim world that we're looking at uh, is being concentrated upon by the United States as a focus of threat. Uh, and I think it would be a mistake to see it in any way in a, in a monolithic sense. Uh, this is not uh, uh, the Soviet Union. Um, rather, it is from this Muslim world that uh, a series of very small, tiny, asymmetrical organizations have recruited and, and, and sought to recruit uh, members these are non-state organizations, but, but are political challengers to states. Some have suggested that the best pre-modern analogy to them is, is piracy. Uh, pirates often had a certain degree of organization on the high seas. Uh, and they uh, had the apparatus of states, which is warships, uh, but they put them to private use. Um, these small groups are focused on inflicting harm on the United States and on U.S. allies in the region and uh, in Europe. Uh, the reason for which they wish to inflict this harm has to do with their own political aspirations in the Muslim world uh, for leadership. I'd like to caution against two common errors in this regard. First of all, radical Muslim fundamentalism is not intrinsic to Islam. There is nothing in Islam that engenders such groups naturally. Uh, they are political organizations which are made possible by the technology of modernity. Their ideologies are uh, uh, very frequently thin, not well grounded in Islamic texts, indeed Osama bin Laden, uh, uh, the leader of Al-Qaeda, will very frequently misquote the Quran in the sense of quoting only half a verse. Uh, you know, you can, uh, you can have your way with the text if you don't quote the last part. Uh, and uh, it's very common among these, uh, um, among these radicals to misuse the Quran in this way. Uh, and they have been condemned uh, for it by uh, uh, authorities in the Muslim world, by clerics. Um, I would argue that in their smallness, uh, in their appeal to a kind of pathological nationalism, uh, these groups are analogous uh, to the Ku Klux Klan in the United States, uh, in some ways to other cult-like groups, such as the David Koresh group at Waco. Islamic law itself, the mainstream of the tradition, forbids terror, uh, as our colleague at the University of Michigan, Sherman Jackson, has a long article on Haraba, or uh, the, for, the forbidding of terror in Islamic law. Um, and uh, as for holy war or jihad, uh, it is a complex subject. Uh, I, I guarantee you that most Muslims, most of the time, don't have it on their mind. Uh, but uh, for those who do, uh, there are rules about jihad, about holy war in Islam. It's a ritual. Uh, you have to give the enemy notice that you're coming. You have to give the enemy the opportunity to convert if, if the enemy so desires and so to avoid a war. You may not kill non-combatants, uh, innocents, uh, women, children, uh, unarmed men. 
uh, who are not part of the war effort. If you go through their very long, thick books on the rules of jihad and medieval Islamic jurisprudence, uh, something like a terror attack is simply not Islamic. It's not Islamic law, it's not part of the tradition. Uh, it's, it's contrary to it in every way. The other, um, the other caution I'd like to make uh, is that I view it as a profound error to see uh, the problem of Al-Qaeda and kindred groups as one of large social movements, analogous to fascism, uh, or of a state challenge analogous to Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union. Uh, these are small, fringe groups. They do not have very much support in most of the Muslim world. And uh, as you'll see, uh, what support they do have is often declining. Uh, they uh, do not represent uh, very, very large numbers of people. Uh, they're not a movement. Uh, and uh, they uh, don't, at the moment, control any states at all. So if we looked at the Muslim world from the point of view of American foreign relations with governments, with states, it wouldn't look at all uh, uh, like a, um, a monochrome mass, like, like, like a monolith. Uh, I have put in, in, in dark blue uh, the countries that have more or less secular regimes. Uh, the military regime in Egypt, which is based on secular Arab nationalism, the military regime in Algeria, which is based on secular uh, uh, Arab nationalism, and which has since the early 90s fought uh, a bloody and uh, long uh, civil war with Islamic groups uh, seeking to impose Islamic law uh, uh, on Algeria. The secularists in Algeria won that civil war, in, in the course of which over 100,000 people died in the 1990s. Uh, Turkey is a, uh, a secular, a, a, a militantly secular government. Um, uh, the former Soviet uh, um, states of uh, now, now independent of Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, uh, and so forth, all have secular governments, uh, disapprove of too much practice of Islam, I, I think we mostly, those of us who haven't, uh, any of us who haven't uh, encountered, haven't been to those places, haven't encountered Muslims from that background, aren't aware of how deracinated the Muslims of uh, the former Soviet Union really are. Um, I had a conference in Tashkent in the mid-90s uh, in Uzbekistan, uh, at the end of which the Uzbek scholars insisted that we had to have a party to uh, celebrate the end of the conference, and I agreed and uh, they showed up with these huge white shopping bags that were very bulky and full of jingling things. And we wondered what, what this party was doing to consist of, and they started pulling out the bottles of Stolichnaya vodka, one <laughs> after another. Um, in this uh, map, I've, I've uh, shown the dark blue as pro-American uh, uh, secular states, uh, mainly uh, nationalist states of one, way, one sort or another. And I've shown in, uh, in light green uh, conservative states that are either pro-American or have good relations with the United States. Uh, and so what's left that's a menace in, with regard to states? Well, uh, the only places on this map that show Muslim uh, majority states uh, which have bad relations with the United States are dark green, which are Iran, Sudan, and Somalia. Somalia, not so much that they're determined to have bad relations with the United States as that they can't get their act together about having a government at all. Uh, and, um, and Syria, the, the little red uh, spot, uh, which is a secular Arab nationalist regime, but also uh, not in good relations with the United States. So it is the, the, the green spaces and the red, uh, not very much of the Muslim world looks like it has bad relations with the United States. 
This is one of the things that as someone who has lived in the region for many years and who studies it uh, uh, professionally, I hear Washington politicians talking about the Muslim world or the Middle East as though it's full of enemies. And yet, I can't find them on the map. And even the enemies that I can find, so-called, are ambiguous. So for instance, I remember Colin Powell, the former Secretary of State, coming out and saying that Sudan had been extremely cooperative and useful in the war on terror. Is that an enemy? Uh, Syria was as well. And uh, then as for Iran, which is dark green and now increasingly uh, uh, in the sights of Washington, it is a Shiite Islamic State. Uh, it's true it's had often bad relations with the United States, but it hates Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. So the one Islamic State in the region which the United States has bad relations with uh, in a way is a potential ally against Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was born to fight the Soviet occupation of Muslim Afghanistan. It was a Cold War phenomenon. It was complex. Uh, the Soviets overplayed their hand in going into Afghanistan, which is uh, known in, to historians as a graveyard of uh, empires. Uh, and uh, the idea that was then apparently predominant in Moscow that the Pushtuns would make good communists uh, uh, puzzles all of us to this day. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the response of the Pushtun population, the major population in Afghanistan, who have, are known through modern history as strict Muslims and as having given the British Empire a great deal of trouble as well, uh, the, the, their response to the Soviet invasion was to take up arms and to try to push the, the Soviets back out as foreign atheists bothering a Muslim country. Importantly, they gathered these mainly Pushtun, although there were some other ethnic groups involved as well. The Tajiks, uh, uh, the Persian speakers, threw up some uh, Mujahideen or freedom fighters in Afghanistan. Uh, that was back when uh, President Reagan uh, approved of uh, Mujahideen uh, and appraised them as freedom fighters. Uh, they also gathered allies among Arab populations pre predominantly although some others, uh, who were volunteers. Uh, they would, uh, young men who would uh, pick up from Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Algeria, and elsewhere, and go off uh, to uh, fight as irregulars uh, against the Soviets. This, um, the people who did this, the young men who went off to engage in that fight, often had fought their own government at home or, or deeply disapproved of their own government at home as a secular pro-Western government. And uh, uh, their fight in Afghanistan against Soviet atheism was a form of sublimation. They were doing that because they had failed at the other or didn't have good prospects at it. Um, the Saudi Arabia, uh, one of America's main allies in the Middle East, had agreed with the Reagan administration to match American contributions to the Mujahideen fighting in Afghanistan. Uh, the Saudis uh, uh, gave a lot of money directly. Uh, the Saudis, uh, the Saudi government appears to have recruited a young man named Osama bin Laden from a wealthy construction family uh, as a fundraiser. Uh, and given his business connections and his own uh, personal interest in uh, uh, fu fundamentalist religion, uh, he proved uh, uh, a very successful fundraiser for the movement. Ultimately, it succeeded. Uh, the United States uh, funding uh, of the Mujahideen uh, and its Arab allies, uh, which became Al-Qaeda, to the tune of uh, $5 billion, uh, matched by Saudi Arabia uh, made so much trouble for the Soviets in Afghanistan that they simply uh, could not stay. And by 1989, the last Soviet tank had gone across Friendship Bridge back over into Uzbekistan. 
Well, for bin Laden and the other movement leaders, uh, this victory was bittersweet because on the one hand, it was a big victory. On the other hand, what do you do now? Uh, and bin Laden was not the sort of person who wanted to go back to building condos in Riyadh, uh, which was what the sort of thing his family did for a living. And uh, he looked around for other causes. Uh, he fixed upon the first intifada uh, or uh, uprising of the Palestinians uh, in the West Bank, uh, on Kashmir, on Chechnya, on Bosnia, on places where he felt uh, Muslims were being unfairly oppressed by non-Muslims. And there was a strong element of pan-Islamic nationalism in his, uh, in his ideology. So Al-Qaeda had a twofold character, uh, which is difficult to disentangle. On the one hand, it clearly was defensive. The Soviets had invaded Afghanistan. They were attempting to impose the communist system on a Muslim country. Uh, and many of the groups associated with Al-Qaeda were genuinely concerned about situations in which Muslims were being uh, uh, killed in large numbers by uh, non-Muslim occupiers uh, from a Muslim point of view. Uh, but there was also an offensive element to Al-Qaeda, which is that it was made up of politicians, of people who wanted to have a leading role in their society. Uh, and so it was intended to mobilize Muslim publics. Uh, from bin Laden's point of view, most Muslims weren't mu worth much as Muslims. They sat around watching American sitcoms in Arabic translation, drinking Coca-Cola, uh, wearing blue jeans, uh, listening to uh, uh, Western music. Uh, to the extent that they had any politics, it was secular politics. They were all enthusiastic about being Arab nationalists or Egyptian nationalists or something like that. Uh, and uh, so they were in the back pocket of the United States. They, were, they had given up Islam, more or less, for other forms of political identity. And bin Laden felt that this had been a, a huge error and had led to them being weak and easily dominated. Uh, a, a Muslim world full of tiny countries with a colonial legacy, like Tunisia or Jordan, uh, was, a, was a, a region full of non-entities. Why would anybody care in Paris or London or Washington or Beijing uh, what Jordan or Tunisia wanted? Uh, from bin Laden's point of view, the Muslim community had had, uh, in the form of the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, uh, a relatively united polity, which was a big, important empire and was taken seriously in world affairs. And the, in World War I, the Ottoman Empire was car carved up uh, made into small colonies and mandates by the Western powers, which they then bequeathed as a legacy to the region. Bin Laden would like to see that reversed. He would like to see a Muslim superstate uh, with a caliph or Muslim pope-like figure at its head, who would also be a uh, political figure. Um, but this uh, dream of a pan-Islamic uh, superstate is, is, of course, a, a kind of utopia, and it's not expected that it would be achieved anytime soon. Uh, it is a way of mobilizing Muslim publics into a different kind of politics, not nationalist, not pro-Western. Uh, it's also a way of mobilizing them away from being good capitalist consumers, uh, which... Uh, um, Bin Laden has fought against uh, for years and, and without very much success. Indeed, it is said that he was very frustrated to frequently find his children drinking Coke. Al-Qaeda also sought, and its constituent parts, sought the overthrow of secular, pro-Western, Middle Eastern governments. Uh, Egypt, Algeria, Saudi Arabia, well, Saudi Arabia is not a secular government, but it's a pro-Western one. Uh, and from their point of view, it didn't really matter. Uh, Saudi Arabia, you know, uh, is, uh, it says its, its, its constitution is the Quran, and it is a society in which uh, Islam is very strictly practiced, and there are people called volunteers uh, who carry sticks, and if you're out lollygagging on the street, 
during prayer time, you may expect a, a rather sharp blow uh, to encourage you to go to the mosque and pray. So this is not a, this is not a, a, a wimpy, uh, bleeding heart, liberal, uh, westernized society here. But from bin Laden, it's not Islamic enough. Saudi Arabia needs more Islam from his point of view, and part of what it needs is to break with the United States. In Egypt, which is a relatively secular society, uh, uh, the fringe group Egyptian Islamic Jihad, led by Ayman al-Zawahiri, a, a prominent physician from a prominent Egyptian political family, uh, attempted to kill the president, Hosni Mubarak, in 1995. Uh, they would do things like uh, shoot down tourists uh, at tourist spots in Egypt. Uh, they conducted street battles with Egyptian security. Uh, th the Egyptian government replied by just arresting everybody who looked like they might think about someday perhaps empathizing with Islamic radicals. Uh, 30,000 people were put in jail for essentially thought crimes. Uh, and they weren't let back out until it was clear that they had given up this uh, Islamic Jihad business. In uh, Algeria, uh, the government actually waged a civil war with the uh, Islamic Salvation Front uh, and the armed Islamic group in which uh, altogether over 100,000 died and uh, uh, it's unclear who did most of the killing. It's clear that, that, that very serious human rights violations were conducted on each side. Uh, and, and so by the late 90s, you see, uh, the radical Muslim political groups who had political aspirations in their societies had been roundly defeated. They couldn't plan an operation in Egypt without one of their members immediately writing a memo on it to Husni Mubarak. They had been infiltrated. They couldn't achieve anything from Algeria. 9-11 had to be launched from a failed state, Afghanistan, and from a Western state with relative freedom, which hadn't yet been alerted to the dangers, like Germany, because it couldn't have been launched from Egypt. Egypt had taken care of them. Ayman al-Zawahiri and the Egyptian Islamic Jihad were in such, uh, uh, in such difficult straits by the late 90s that uh, they were broke. Uh, Zawahiri was having difficulty in fundraising. Uh, and uh, it is alleged by some, uh, although it is controversial, that one of the reasons that Zawahiri agreed to join bin Laden in 1998 uh, to, to merge the Egyptian Islamic Jihad and uh, the mainly uh, Saudi Al-Qaeda, was that bin Laden still did have some monetary resources, whereas Zawahiri was broke. Uh, that's been challenged. Uh, there are other reasons for which uh, the, the deal was, was struck. But they formed the International Islamic Front against Jews and Crusaders, um, uh, with a particular animus against the United States. Uh, and they concluded that their attempts to overthrow the Mubarak regime, of course, they had assassinated Egyptian President Anwar Sadat in hopes of provoking a popular revolution that never materialized. Their attempts to overthrow the Algerian government, uh, their intrigues in Saudi Arabia, etc., had not borne fruit. They had been defeated everywhere they tried. And why had they been defeated? Well, they concluded because the United States backed these governments. The United States gives $2 billion in aid every year to the Egyptian government. It conducts joint military uh, exercises with the Egyptian military. Uh, it provides uh, counterterrorism advice. Uh, Egyptian Islamic Jihad couldn't overthrow Hosni Mubarak, as Zawahiri increasingly argued, because he was backed by a superpower. And Al-Qaeda, therefore, begins thinking that in order to accomplish its goals in the Middle East of overthrowing the westernizing secular regimes, or at least the Western, the pro-Western ones, uh, that uh, it would be necessary first to deal with the United States, to hit it, to make it timid, to push it out of the region, to end its support 
for regimes like that of Egypt. And that was why they planned it out and carried out September 11th. And in that way, September 11th really did resemble Pearl Harbor in some significant uh, um, uh, respects. Uh, Pearl Harbor was an attempt to get the US Navy out of the way because the Japanese Empire desperately needed petroleum. The, <clears throat> the United States had cut it off from American petroleum. The only other source of petroleum nearby was uh, in what is now Indonesia, the Dutch uh, East Indies. And it was clear to the Japanese that if the Americans were going to cut them off, they had two choices. One was to give up their empire in China. The other would be to replace the American petroleum with, uh, with the uh, Indonesian petroleum. Uh, in order to do that, they would have to conquer Southeast Asia. And the thing standing between them and conquering Southeast Asia was the US Navy. And that was why they hit Pearl Harbor, was to get the fleet out of the way. And it was uh, tactically a successful move. They did get the fleet out of the way, and then they swept through Southeast Asia and conquered it. And they conquered Indonesia, and they got the oil. And they were able to keep their empire going for a while. The US Navy had the last say in the matter. Uh, it was only a temporary tactical success. In the same way, Al-Qaeda wanted to get the United States out of the way so that it had a clearer shot at overthrowing governments like that of Mubarak. The Al-Qaeda organization, I think, was confident that were the United States to reply to the September 11 attacks with a conventional military strike in Afghanistan, that that could be withstood. It was their experience that when the Soviets put tanks down the Panjshir Valley, that they could just blow up the tanks. Uh, and so they expected the United States to be similarly flat-footed. Uh, the team of, uh, around uh, George W. Bush, uh, uh, including CIA uh, head uh, George Tenet, however, came up with an alternative plan, and I believe that the credit goes uh, very substantially to Tenet, uh, providing U.S. Uh, close air support, including smart weapons, to uh, the Northern Alliance, that faction of Afghans that had not accepted Taliban rule, and tipping the balance of military power in Afghanistan towards the Northern Alliance. It, it had always been uh, somewhat evenly matched. The Taliban had a slight advantage and therefore were gaining territory. But with uh, U.S. Uh, air support, the Northern Alliance could rather easily defeat the Taliban once the Taliban tanks were uh, disabled and their Toyotas with the machine gun emplacements in the back were, uh, were, were uh, uh, reduced to rubble. Uh, the Northern Alliance was able to uh, push the Taliban back and, and to defeat them. And in the course of the war, the United States uh, destroyed the 40 Al-Qaeda terror training camps, which were being used to produce uh, legions of terrorists. Uh, they were compared by one U.S. analyst to uh, swamps from which the mosquitoes came. And had those camps been allowed to continue to operate, uh, they would have continued to produce terror attacks on the United States. The Afghan, uh, Afghanistan War of 2001-2002 was uh, a victory, a tactical victory in the war on terror. But it was a compromised victory, in retrospect. Bin Laden and other top Al-Qaeda leaders escaped. Uh, the new Afghan government that was installed is weak and unstable. Uh, President uh, Karzai, uh, who did win uh, a national election uh, with millions of votes, nevertheless is often derisively referred to as the mayor of Kabul because it's not entirely clear that his uh, power and authority run to the rest of the country. Uh, almost immediately uh, with the end of the war, uh, the old warlords of the early uh, uh, 90s, uh, those who had been Mujahideen in the 80s, re-emerged to establish warlord rule in much of the country. Um, US Reconstruction funds 
were often given to private contractors and so didn't much reach the ordinary Afghans. Over time, there's been a resurgence of the Taliban in the south in the Pashtun areas. Uh, and uh, there's also been a very unwelcome and worrisome resurgence of the poppy trade. Uh, poppy cultivation is way up in Afghanistan. It's up 60% uh, uh, this year. Uh, it accounts for uh, well over half of Afghanistan's uh, gross domestic product. Uh, there are many, many farmers that are deeply dependent on it. Uh, nearly 80% of the world's opium now is coming from Afghanistan. And the security concern here is narco-terrorism. When you have that much money coming in from an illegal drug, uh, it's entirely possible uh, that it will be siphoned off by the Taliban and, and a resurgent al-Qaeda for terror purposes. In the meantime, uh, al-Qaeda and its branches uh, and its affiliates uh, continued uh, to uh, conduct terror attacks against their targets uh, already in uh, late December, uh, in late uh, 2001. Uh, the uh, Jaish Muhammad and Lashkar-e Taiba, radical Muslim groups uh, uh, focused on uh, Indian Kashmir, which has a Muslim majority but is ruled by Hindu India, uh, uh, attacked India's parliament. Uh, 12 October 2002, there was the bombing of the Bali nightclub, in which 202 persons were killed. Uh, that was a, an operation of the jamaat e islami uh, which is uh, a, the Southeast Asian branch of Al-Qaeda, uh, led by Assam Hanbali, uh, who uh, had uh, fought in Afghanistan with bin Laden, uh, and who uh, later on was captured in Thailand. Uh, 16 May 2003, we had the bombings in Casablanca in Morocco. Uh, and note that much of this activity is actually occurring uh, in Muslim countries. Uh, this becomes important for our analysis later. Uh, you had uh, simultaneous attacks in, uh, attacks in Casablanca uh, by the Salafia Jihadiyya organization, not directly related uh, to Al-Qaeda, but uh, inspired by it. Uh, October 7, 2004, you had bombings at Taba in the Sinai, uh, uh, targeting Western tourists and particularly Israeli tourists uh, in Egypt. Uh, in 27 November 2004, you had uh, the bombing of a hotel uh, and a missile fired at an Israeli airliner uh, in Mombasa, Kenya. Um, Saudi Arabia became a major uh, focus of Al-Qaeda activity. There is a, a Saudi branch of the Al-Qaeda which is uh, extremely active uh, and uh, has a certain political base in Saudi Arabia. It's a small base but it exists. Uh, so uh, the first big attack was on the 1st of May 2004 which was called Black Saturday in Saudi Arabia. Seven people were killed uh, at a rampage in the uh, at an oil company in Yanbu. And uh, up until then, uh, the, the Saudi Al-Qaeda had not focused on uh, oil facilities in Saudi Arabia. It wanted to take over the country, so it wanted all the oil to be flowing nicely so that they would get it. Uh, but they decided to begin attacking the kingdom where it was vulnerable, attacking foreigners. Uh, there were attacks in uh, in Riyadh, in the U.S. consulate uh, in Jeddah was attacked. Uh, people were killed. Um, there were suicide bombings in Riyadh. Uh, and uh, this continued in 2005 and 2006, in February of 2006, just this uh, past uh, winter. Uh, a major attack was attempted on the Abqaiq oil facility in Saudi Arabia. Um, Saudi Arabia uh, produces uh, um, over 9 million barrels a day of petroleum. In the whole world, only about 86 million barrels a day are, are produced. So the Saudi production is enormous, and the Saudis export most of that. Uh, and there's a place in Saudi Arabia at Abqaiq, which is pretty important for the Saudi petroleum coming together at a refinery. And if that were taken out, well, it would be a good month or two until it could be repaired. 
You take 9 million barrels a day of petroleum off the market, you see what happens to your gasoline prices in the meantime. And this would be a very significant, if short-term, event in, in the, the world economy. That's the kind of thing that Al-Qaeda has been up to in Saudi Arabia. Now, there have been successes in fighting Al-Qaeda. Uh, its command and control has largely been disrupted. There, some of its major leaders, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Ramzi bin Al-Shib, six other, 600 others in Pakistan were captured. Some of them through a sting uh, that uh, the FBI and the CIA got up in the Western Union office in Karachi. And the Western Union office was used by the terrorists to send the money. Uh, so when uh, we figured that out, we just uh, had our guy take the order. And uh, mysteriously, people would, dis would disappear into Guantanamo Bay. Um, however, that operation, as successful as it was, eventually became known. I mean, uh, the, the, Western, the, the, the CIA and the FBI apparently were somewhat amazed at how long they kept falling, falling for this. I mean, didn't they notice like their friends weren't around anymore? But uh, uh, eventually they caught on. Uh, so it's been some time now, I think, since we've had an inside operation uh, that's able to target Al-Qaeda. And so there are uh, Al-Qaeda operatives in Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, that we don't have a good fix on. Um, despite the war in Afghanistan and uh, the uh, counterterrorism measures in, uh, in Pakistan, uh, uh, there were larger issues that September 11th seemed to me to broach. Uh, I think it was a signal that it's unwise for a great power like the United States to allow profound cultural and civilizational conflicts to fester. That the use of the good offices of the United States to come to an equitable resolution, something that all sides can live with, that's, uh, that's what diplomacy is about, uh, is incumbent. And uh, in the absence of uh, such uh, thoroughgoing and responsible statesmanship, uh, the United States uh, is living in a dangerous environment. Uh, and so it seems to me that uh, a push for a, a just and equitable resolution of the Israeli-Palestine issue, which was very near to being resolved in 1999, it's now often forgotten, uh, uh, in 1999-2000, uh, a, a just and equitable resolution in Kashmir uh, Chechnya, other hot spots which affect Muslims uh, and which uh, enrage them uh, would have been all to the good. That wasn't done in any significant way. And uh, Bob Pape at the University of Chicago brought out a book in which he studied the suicide bombers uh, that had been active in the world since 1980. Not by any means all of them Muslim. Uh, there are the Tamil Tigers uh, in South Asia. But he found that uh, he could explain almost all suicide bombing by reference to a feeling of foreign military occupation. That it is a response to feeling uh, that, that, one is, that one is occupied by foreigners militarily, involuntarily. He also found, however, that it tended to uh, be deployed where the occupier had a relatively democratic society, there was a public opinion, and so forth. No suicide bombers against the Chinese. Mm, there are people in Xinjiang, which is a Muslim area of uh, northwest China, which are not, who are not very happy about the way the Chinese are running Xinjiang, but they don't bother trying to impress upon the Chinese government how upset they are. Uh, th this, this is a technique that's used uh, with regard to relatively open societies. And then, of course, the Bush administration made a fateful decision to turn its, injury, its, its energies towards Iraq. Already in November of 2001, uh, CENTCOM commander General Tommy Franks was being asked by Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld for a war plan against Iraq. 
uh, already in early winter of 2002, uh, money and material were actually being diverted from the Afghanistan effort uh, to Kuwait. Uh, it's been, questions have been raised as to whether this was even legal since Congress hadn't authorized such a thing. Um, the Bush administration alleged that Iraq was a gathering threat to the United States, that it had weapons of mass destruction, and an active nuclear weapons program which was two to five years from producing a bomb. Vice President Dick Cheney repeatedly asserted or hinted at a strong connection between the Saddam Hussein regime and Al-Qaeda. Neither of these allegations was true. The set of allegations was questioned by uh, the State Department uh, Intelligence and Research Unit, among the best little intelligence agencies we've got in the US government. Uh, but uh, those questions, uh, that data was shouted down, and there was a rush to war. Enormous resources, resources were diverted from the struggle uh, against Al-Qaeda and, and the struggle to reconstruct Afghanistan to Iraq. And then the Iraq occupation became itself a generator of terrorism. First of all, the U.S. conquest of Iraq was not accepted by the Sunni Arab minority that had ruled Iraq, uh, some 20% of the population. This was a well-educated group of people, on the whole, who had had managerial experience. They were, the one, they were the ones who ran the state industries. They were the officers in the military. Uh, they, um, they waited a bit to see what was going to happen in the new Iraq, and they decided they didn't like it. The United States in Iraq backed uh, a set of, of Shiite and Kurdish uh, leaders who uh, implemented a plan for what they called debathification. This was a punishment to all members of the Ba'ath party above a certain level, and it was a relatively low bar, uh, which excluded them from political society, often resulted in their loss of jobs. Uh, at a time when the Iraqi economy was uh, paralyzed, when unemployment was very high, 100,000 Sunni, largely Sunni Iraqis were fired from their jobs for having been members of the Ba'ath Party. Uh, and things were set up in Iraq in the old days so that eh, if you were a high school teacher, an English teacher, and you wanted to go to London for a summer course on Shakespeare to be a better English teacher there in Samara, well, you had to have a passport to go to London. How do you get a passport in 1994? You have to be a member of the Ba'ath Party. So... The ambitious would apply for a passport, join the party, and go off to study Shakespeare. Comes 2003, and George W. Bush fires them for having done so. This and a number of other missteps began an insurgency in the Sunni Arab areas of Iraq that has grown from strength to strength, has come to encompass virtually the entirety of the Sunni Arab population, and has thrown up governing structures alternative to those of the new government installed by the Americans in Fallujah, in Ramadi, in Samarra, in Tikrit, and in much of Baghdad, the capital of the country. A very great deal of Baghdad is not under U.S. or Iraqi government control. In order to fight this insurgency, the United States took desperate measures. It took 
literally tens of thousands of Sunni Iraqis into custody, interrogated them. Uh, sometimes people were arrested for being in the wrong area at the wrong time and were kept for three months without charges. Uh, search and destroy missions were, were uh, set up. Uh, the Marines would uh, knock down doors, go into uh, a place where uh, the family was suspected of supporting the insurgency, search the house, uh, go through the women's uh, under things as they stood in their nightgowns in the middle of the room in a society that practices strict gender segregation and where uh, un, uh, unrelated males are not to see uh, a woman unveiled. Uh, you had the Marine standing there in the woman's living, uh, bedroom uh, and her in her nightgown and they were going through her under things. Uh, these sound like minor things, and no doubt they seemed minor to the U.S. military. They were cultural affronts of a very severe sort. And the accumulation of such humiliations uh, created a feud between all of the major Sunni Arab tribes and the U.S. military. A feud that continues today. Among those captured and interrogated at Abu Ghraib, some were tortured. The torturing of those people was inexcusable and a crime. Taking pictures of them being tortured was inexcusable, a crime, and extremely stupid. And those pictures eventually surfaced. Karl Rove, President Bush's political advisor, suggested that it would be 25 years before the United States began overcoming the public relations problem with the Muslim world that those pictures produced. And then the US reduced the city of Fallujah, which had become an insurgent stronghold in November of 2004 sparking a widespread revolt throughout the Sunni Arab regions and knocking many Sunni Iraqis off <clears throat> their fence. If they had wondered whether they should join the insurgency, this decided them. Uh, Fallujah was seen as a significant military victory by the United States. It was seen as an unwarranted destruction of an Iraqi city by the Iraqi Sunnis. And the story of Fallujah, where two-thirds of the buildings were destroyed, where some unknown number of civilians were killed, the story of Fallujah circulated throughout the Muslim world, including in the UK, among Britons of Mirpuri or Kashmiri heritage, and became a recruitment tool for Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda-like groups. Uh, and so in, on 7-7 in London, the subway is blown up by young men who in their suicide tapes that have now been released by Ayman al-Zawahiri, the number two man of Al-Qaeda, talk about their grievances over the oppression inflicted on the Muslims of Iraq by the United States and the United Kingdom. There have been a number of terrorists strikes that are directly related to the U.S. presence in Iraq, uh, the 11th of March 2004 Madrid train bombings, which was by a local group not directly in contact with Al-Qaeda, but which had learned from the internet uh, and, uh, and, and by example. Uh, in 9 November 2005, there were very significant bombings of hotels in Amman in Amman by uh, an Al-Qaeda in Iraq affiliate. Over 60 were killed and 115 uh, injured. Increasingly, uh, Al-Qaeda is becoming a franchise uh, in the sense that uh, small local groups of disgruntled radicals will take up its banner, but without a direct relationship to the old Al-Qaeda organization. The internet has become uh, an extremely important vector uh, for such franchising. Any struggle against Islamic radicalism or Muslim radicalism 
requires a, a waging of a war for hearts and minds. How has the United States been doing in that war in the Muslim world? Arab attitudes towards the United States are generally unchanged in the past, past six years. They dipped substantially in 2003 when the United States invaded Iraq. But they were already very low. Uh, the United States is viewed in the Arab world as playing an unhelpful role in the Arab-Israeli conflict, as, uh, uh, as uh, unduly uh, partisan uh, towards the Israeli side as unduly unsympathetic to the Palestinians uh, and other uh, Israeli uh, uh, opponents. Negative views in Egypt, uh, in Egypt of the US were already at, at, at 76% in, in 2002. Uh, that's two thirds had a negative view of the United States. Uh, now you would say that's about as bad as it could get. But in 2004, in the wake of Abu Ghraib, the, the um, negative uh, view of the United States in Egypt went to 98%. Uh, I'm quite sure the other 2% didn't like us either, but there was some reason for which they wouldn't admit it. Um, and that's fallen now in uh, 2005 to 85%. Um, on the other hand, uh, there is this one um, anomaly I can't figure out. In Morocco, uh, uh, we became more popular uh, in the past year, uh, in, in 2000, in the, in, in, from 2004 to 2005. Uh, and uh, about half of Moroccans are now saying they have a favorable view of the United States. Uh, the, the Pew uh, uh, Charitable Trust, which does this polling, uh, th thinks it may have something to do with uh, women and youth uh, being favorable toward the United States and being afraid of uh, the rise of Islamic conservatism. Uh, but uh, uh, I'd want to see next year's poll too because it could be a fluke. Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim country uh, population-wise, 245 million people, uh, began a transition to democracy in 1999 that has been pretty robust. And there's a lot of freedom of speech, freedom of press, uh, parliamentary politics. Uh, GDP, uh, gross domestic product per capita per annum of, of uh, uh, $3,600, uh, that's in purchasing power parity. Uh, uh, it would be lower if, if we were in straight uh, dollar conversion. Uh, but a very substantial, important country, a oil producer, uh, and, a may, and, and the largest Muslim country. In, in the year 2000, 70% of the Indonesians had a favorable view of the United States. That's quite remarkable. Whoever the State Department people were in Indonesia in the 1970s and 80s and 90s should be found and congratulated. In 2002, in the wake of the Afghanistan war, which was largely unpopular in the Muslim world, it was it was felt that the United States went too far, that it was, kind of went a little crazy. Well, okay, so bin Laden's a bad guy, so capture bin Laden. You don't have to overthrow a whole country. Uh, that was the kind of thinking that was going on. So it fell to 60%. Still not so bad, you could live with that. But then when Bush invaded Iraq in 2003, the favorability rating of the United States and Indonesia went to 15% that pitiful little red thing down there was what was left of our favorability. Uh, that rebounded, interestingly, in, uh, in 2005 in the wake of the tsunami, when President Bush uh, announced that he was sending the Navy to help the Indonesians in, in, with relief work, uh, and did. And the US did a lot of good work in Indonesia and, uh, and uh, provided aid. And uh, that brought us back up to 38% approval. But then uh, the most recent sounding taken in 2006, we'd fallen back to uh, 30%. Uh, good deeds only go so far when you're occupying a whole Muslim country. In Turkey, there's in a way a sadder story. Uh, over 50% of Turks uh, had a positive view of the United States uh, in the year 2000. Remember, Turkey is a largely secular 
uh, government at least, and a lot of the population is secular, uh, and is a member of NATO, had fought with the US in, in Korea, and uh, a longtime ally. Uh, so um, uh, with the Afghanistan war, the favorability rating falls to 30%. Uh, with the Iraq war, it falls uh, to 15%. The Indonesians and the Turks agreed about this. Uh, and um, then uh, uh, there's, a, there's a slight bump, but then in 2006, it's back down to 12%. 12% favorability rating in, in, in Turkey. And these are our old time friends. Um, well, uh, I, uh, I suspect that some of this uh, dislike of the United States, and it's all related to policy. Whenever you ask the Muslims, why do you like the, dislike the United States? They never say because of their way of life. Uh, they always say because we don't like US foreign policy. And in fact, the statistics I'm showing you demonstrate this because why would they bounce around like that? We haven't changed our way of life from year to year. Uh, not that much anyway. Um, it's because of policy. But I suspect that uh, the rise of Iraqi Kurdistan, the prospect that Iraq may break up and create a Kurdistan, which might then threaten uh, Turkey uh, with breakup, since it has a large Kurdish population in eastern Anatolia, and the ways in which the Iraqi Kurds have uh, uh, been allowed by the Americans to harbor uh, PKK terrorists uh, who have been hitting Turkey, all of these things, I think, must have fed into uh, this very negative view of the United States and Turkey now. Um, so let me conclude with, uh, with in two ways, one with some good news and one with some cautions. The good news is, uh, contrary to what you will hear and I have heard with my own ears in Washington, D.C. from prominent U.S. politicians, the United States does not face a large-scale conventional and weapons of mass destruction military threat such as that of Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union. Most Muslim-majority states are U.S. allies or are cooperative with the United States. Hostile states such as Syria and Sudan have been willing to cooperate against Al-Qaeda and it's very clear that there are ways in which those could be brought aboard. Al-Qaeda's own popularity has fallen in much of the Muslim world. Uh, Moroccans, uh, Turks, and others uh, confess increasing doubts as to bin Laden's uh, uh, competence. Uh, many Muslims report themselves as worried about terrorism or Islamic extremism as a homegrown problem. Saudi Arabia and Morocco and elsewhere. When Al-Qaeda began conducting bombings on Muslim soil, they turned against them many of their potential recruits. But there are cautions going forward. The Al-Qaeda leadership is still out there, is still active. I personally believe that there is good evidence that Ayman al-Zawahiri uh, was behind the 7-7 London, London subway bombings uh, last year. Uh, I think it's very suspicious that now he has shown up in Al Jazeera with two of the suicide tapes of bombers. Uh, I believe he worked through a radical Pakistani group like Lashkar e Taiba, uh, the Good Army, uh, to uh, recruit uh, these uh, Britons of, 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 uh, of South Asian heritage uh, for, for this operation. Uh, there has been a rapid deterioration, as we've just seen, in public approval of the U.S in the non-Arab Muslim world. In the Muslim world, our reputation was already, in the Arab world, our reputation was already shot as a partisan in the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, in the wider Muslim world, in places like Indonesia and Turkey, where that issue didn't have as much salience, salience we had a higher reputation. That now seems to have declined very substantially. And the reason given uh, to the pollsters by the uh, respondents is the Iraq occupation. Al-Qaeda copycats are spreading via the internet. Uh, the most worrisome uh, such incident was the Madrid train bombings uh, uh, in 2004. Uh, Afghanistan is increasingly unstable. There is a resurgent Taliban, two to 5,000 fighters. Uh, the poppy cultivation is a potential source of funding for uh, resurgent uh, terror in uh, that area. 
Uh, the guerrilla insurgency in Iraq is spreading terror in Iraq itself, and there's uh, some evidence that it's spilling over onto neighbors such as Jordan and Saudi Arabia and even Madrid and London. Uh, there is a severe danger as we speak of an Iraqi civil war and of a breakup of the country. Uh, there is a danger that any such breakup will spill over onto uh, the rest of the Middle East. It will not leave Jordan, Israel, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Turkey unaffected. And Al-Qaeda increasingly, and this was underlined by Ayman al-Zawahiri in a videotape released today, is targeting U.S. economic interests in the Persian uh, uh, Gulf, uh, in, especially with regard to petroleum. So the Abqaiq attack, which was foiled and uh, did not wreak the kind of harm that it could have, uh, is perhaps, however, a harbinger of further such attempts. We all live uh, in, a, in, a, in an economic environment in which uh, uh, our access to energy, uh, to petroleum and natural gas is very important. Uh, we've seen a big run up in prices. Uh, the economy has withstood that run up for various reasons, but it's not clear that another doubling or tripling uh, would be sustainable. And uh, it appears that Al Qaeda is thinking seriously uh, about hitting us where it hurts. Thank you. Professor Cole is willing to take some questions. We have mics that should be here in the aisles. We are recording the session, so we do want people to speak into the mics when they ask their questions. Um, I'm assuming we have mics here. Is that right? Do I see people with mics? Jean? Do we have mics? They're out here. Oh, OK, OK, I see them. All right. Uh, do you want to call on people? I will right. let you handle this. Yeah. Uh, th thank Professor Cole, thank you very much for your lecture. It's very enjoyable and educational. I am um, I'm uh, frustrated by the uh, war in Iraq and the Bush administration and the, and the American public's uh, seeming fixation on the idea that uh, we're attacked because they don't like our freedoms, they don't like our democracy, and we never seem to think about our interests of uh, Israel and uh, oil. And I, I guess um, I'm frustrated with the Democrats for not being willing to oppose the Bush administration and the Republicans for not being willing to oppose the Bush administration and the American public. We, can you give us some guidance on uh, how can we have an intelligent, articulate, you know, forward uh, policy that really deals with rational causes of the attacks on the, on the United States and not just um, they don't like our way of life and uh, it's all about democracy. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, let, me, let me address that question, which is a very good question in, in two ways. Let me say first of all that I'd like to make a distinction between uh, Al-Qaeda as an organization and Al-Qaeda-like organizations and the general uh, uh, Muslim publics, uh, they, they're not the same thing. They don't overlap very much. Al-Qaeda is a kind of weird cult from the point of view of most uh, ordinary Muslims. Uh, and so what I would say is that Al-Qaeda's uh, uh, grievances often strike me as uh, somewhat fantastic or overblown, and I wouldn't spend a lot of time worrying about what upsets those people. Uh, if you listen to the trial transcripts of, uh, of, of someone like uh, um, Zakaria Mous Mousawi, the, uh, who was initially accused of being the 20th hijacker, doesn't seem actually to have been, nor, nor to have been of the caliber of person that could have uh, engaged in that uh, operation. Um, I, he just sounded to me like a crackpot. Uh, and, um, uh, a lot of these people sound like that. I'm not saying that they're, they're not rational, but uh, they're, uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri just lives in his own little world. So I, 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 I kind of agree with the Washington consensus, consensus that you just can't pay a, a lot of attention to those people. But of course, 
it's unwise, as I suggested, to have uh, the publics of very large swathes of the world uh, deeply dislike U.S. policy, uh, and especially where U.S. policy could be improved upon. Uh, and so uh, I think we really have to worry about the recruitment pool. We have to worry about the young uh, men in particular who might be targeted in uh, community centers and mosques and gyms by Al-Qaeda recruiters and whose ears would be full of these uh, accusations against the United States of being a genocidal state towards Muslims and so forth. And in that regard, uh, it's, it seems to me that, uh, as you say, uh, so, so, some relatively simple steps could be taken to much improve uh, the relationship of the United States with Muslim publics. Uh, one would be to restart the uh, uh, Israel-Palestine uh, peace process and to come to fairly quickly to uh, a, a, a resolution. Everybody has agreed about the Arab-Israeli conflict. There's not really any conflict. I mean, it's not a conflict over basic principles at this point. In 2002, the Arab League met in Beirut. The, king of, uh, the President King of Saudi Arabia put forward a plan which all of the Arabs would recognize Israel. They'd have full trade and diplomatic relations with Israel. They'd have complete peace. All that Israel would have to do would be to go back to the 67 borders. Well, that's unacceptable to Israel, of course. But... Nevertheless, once the Saudis and the Arab League have said that to Israel, it can't take it back. They can't say, well, yes, we, we, we agreed that we can, we can live with you, we can recognize you, we can have peace with you, but you didn't meet our, our one little criterion here, therefore it's all off. No, I mean, they have, they, have, they have recognized Israel more or less with this proposal. There are conditions under which they would, they're saying. Likewise, uh, uh, the Israelis uh, increasingly recognize that they can't just keep the, the territories that they conquered in 1967. Uh, they tried to withdraw from Gaza. Gaza kind of won't let them, uh, keeps wanting to fight. Uh, but uh, uh, they're not committed to the maximalist dream of encompassing all of those territories. Well, if they're willing to withdraw from Gaza, then why won't they withdraw from this, that? The other thing, there should, there should be some way that you could get the Palestinians and the Israelis together and have them agree on what should be withdrawn from. And the day you come out and you have a president of the country of Palestine, not just of the Palestine Authority as you have now, and the president of Palestine says, I'm very happy with my Israeli partners in the peace process. The day you have that that, that happens, 80% of the problems that the United States has in the Muslim world evaporate. It would be better for the Israelis, it would be better for the Arabs, it would be better for us, so why don't they do it already? Uh, with regard to Iraq, that's become a quagmire, and there are no good solutions. You leave, it falls apart, the world goes into chaos, you regret it. You don't leave, it falls apart, the world goes into chaos, you regret it. Uh, it it's, it's not a good situation. Uh, and, uh, however, I can say that, the, that staying the course, just going on doing more of whatever we have been doing, clearly is just not working. This summer, we had the Battle of Baghdad. Did you know about the Battle of Baghdad? Did they tell you about that? They had the Battle of Baghdad. The U.S. military brought in thousands of extra troops. 3,500 were brought down from Mosul, and they went into the Sunni Arab neighborhoods, Ghazaliya, Amariya, where the death squads were operating and the, the, the insurgents were in control. And they said they were going to do sweeps. They're going to clean it out. There's not going to be so much death and destruction in Baghdad. In July, 1,500 people were killed in Baghdad. A lot of them, 90%, just showed up in the morning dead, one bullet behind the, the ear. Uh, uh, and um, uh, handcuffed and, and tortured. And some were Shiites tortured by Sunnis, some were Sunnis tortured by Shiites. So we expected with the Battle of Baghdad having been gone in early August, that by late August we'd have some good news here. There would be less death and destruction and so forth. And the U.S. military actually came out and said, yes, the murder rate has fallen. Well, I wondered, what do they mean the murder rate has fallen? Are, I mean, is that really the problem in Baghdad, is the murder rate? I mean, is it, is it like irate neighbors taking each other out. I mean, the problem was the death squads. So what has fallen in that regard? And it turns out nothing had fallen. 1,600 dead, 
in, in August, uh, according to the Baghdad morgue. So the Battle of Baghdad has produced an increase of 100 in, in those kinds of deaths. Uh, that was, I heard from a US military officer in Baghdad that this was Iraq's last chance. This was the big push. If, if this didn't work, then it just was over with. Well, I don't see any evidence that it's working. Um, it seems like throughout your, throughout your entire lecture, you sort of uh, kind of avoided one of the big topics in American Middle East policy, which is that of Iran right now. And how can the U.S. deal with sort of the increasing Ameri anti-American hatred that's emanating from there, combined with sort of Iran's kind of power surge and their quest for nuclear weapons? Like, what sort of policy proposals can the U.S. actually make? Yeah. Uh, the question has to do with Iran. I didn't address Iran because my subject was the war on Al-Qaeda, really. And Iran, being adherents of the Shiite branch of Islam, uh, deeply dislikes Al-Qaeda, which is hyper-Sunni and you know, influenced by Wahhabism in Saudi Arabia and considers the Shiites to be wretched heretics. Um, it's now forgotten, uh, and I was saying this at lunch, that um, in the aftermath of September 11th, the Iranians sympathized with the United States. Uh, they had suffered from uh, terrorism, things had been blown up in Iran, uh, and in particular had suffered with the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, who were right on their borders, and had killed uh, Iranians in, in Afghanistan, had massacred uh, Hazara Shiites uh, in the center of the country, who were political clients of Iran. So uh, after September 11th, there were candlelight vigils in Iran. You can actually find still pictures of this on uh, Google Images, if you look, uh, uh, in sympathy for the United States. Um, and President, uh, then President Mohammed Khatami came to the United Nations and uh, spoke, I think, with great warmth and sincerity about the horror he felt at what the United States had suffered. Uh, so it's not a given Iran has to be an enemy in this, in this respect. Uh, then in January of 2002, suddenly President Bush gave his State of the Union address and he tagged Iran as a member of the Axis of Evil. The Iranians were very confused by this because they'd like had the candlelight vigils and they had spoken about how they sympathized with the U.S. And, and they were even more puzzled because from, a, from an Iranian point of view, here's what happened in in the late 90s is that the Pakistanis, first of all, developed an atomic bomb. And then they wanted strategic depth in Afghanistan for their struggle with India. So they created and promoted the Taliban and, and the Taliban coddled Al-Qaeda. So after September 11th, Pakistan is threatened by Colin Powell, the then Secretary of State, and it switches around. It betrays the Taliban, cuts them off, uh, and becomes an ally of the United States in the war on terror. So the Iranians are looking at this and say, hey, those guys have an atomic bomb. They created the Taliban. They coddled Al-Qaeda. And now they're the good guys. And we're in the axis of evil. We were fighting the Taliban. They can't understand. Why, why did, did Washington decide to do this? Well, of course, there's a long history of animosity between the Islamic Republic of Iran and the United States. There are old grudges, uh, and uh, there are suspicions that the Iranians' uh, nuclear energy program, which is all that we know that they have, is a nuclear energy research program, uh, may also be uh, um, uh, intended ultimately to uh, produce an atomic bomb. Uh, I mean, from an Iranian point of view, I guess they could ask, why is it all right for Pakistan to have one but not us? Uh, and uh, you could say, well, Pakistan's been an ally, and then, then the Iranians would throw up that Taliban thing at you. Um, Iran, uh, it seems to me, is a more complex issue than is being made of it in Washington. First of all, mm, I would estimate that no more than 20% of Iranians support the present government. Uh, it is a very decidedly minority government. It was elected in a runoff from a runoff, 
And moreover, there were very serious allegations of electoral misconduct in the course of the election. A liberal candidate seems to have uh, been the victim of ballot stuffing. Uh, so um, uh, it's not as if we're facing a united threat which is anti-American and so forth. Uh, the, the Iranian government is certainly a, a, uh, a, a problem for Washington. It has engaged in activities that Washington feel is very unhealthy. It has engaged in anti-Americanism. But uh, there's not good evidence of uh, since 1997, which was a big change in Iranian politics. There's not good evidence, in my view, of Iran having conducted any uh, terrorism against the United States itself. Uh, and um, uh, so I don't, I don't view Iran as uh, a question in the war on terror. I, uh, I think it's a completely different set of issues. Uh, there's a long history between Iran and the United States. If, if, if what the United States wanted in Iran was a parliamentary democracy, well, they had that in 1953 and we overthrew it. Uh, so uh, I think that, uh, that just simply characterizing them in a certain way is not going to solve the problems. Yeah, I was, oh, excuse me, I was going to ask a question about Islamo-fascism, but I am more interested in your opinion of whether you think bin Laden and Zawari are still sort of hanging out in a cave together, or whether Al-Qaeda has sort of diverged, these two leaders of Al-Qaeda have diverged in terms of propaganda and policy. 